this webinar there it is. As you may see, I'm here. This webinar is being recorded, so this information can be shared with those not able to make it today. We will share the link to the recording with everyone who is registered, so you will have access to it later. Please keep the recording in mind as you ask questions. Because this is a public forum and will be shared publicly, we ask that you do not share any identifying information about someone who may be experiencing domestic violence. My name is Azucena Ugarte, and I am the director of the Office of Domestic Violence Strategies. And I'm here today with my co-workers, Liz Pride and Emily Walter. The Office of Domestic Violence Strategies was created in 2016 by Mayor Kenny with the goal of supporting city departments to improve the way they identify and respond to domestic violence and other forms of gender-based violence. Today, we're hosting this panel to foster awareness about the specific protections available to survivors in Philadelphia regarding housing, utilities, and unpaid leave from work. We are very happy to have panelists today from Women Against Abuse, Philadelphia Legal Aid, and Community Legal Services. From Women Against Abuse, we have Annie Ball. Annie is an intake service coordinator at Women Against Abuse Legal Center. As part of the intake team, she works with clients who are exploring their legal options, such as protection from abuse orders or custody and support matters. Thank you, Annie, for being here. From Philadelphia Legal Aid, we have Susan Perlstein. Susan is a senior attorney and the violence prevention and policy strategist in the family law unit at PLA. She has specialized in the representation of immigrant victims of sexual assault and family violence, and is dedicated to providing trauma-informed services to clients. Welcome, Susan. From Community Legal Services, we have Tiffany Holland McAnani, the supervising attorney in the housing unit of CLS. Tiffany advocates for safe and affordable housing for vulnerable individuals through direct representation and high impact advocacy. Good to have you here, Tiffany. And also from Community Legal Services, we have Kintesha Scott. Kintesha is a supervising attorney in the energy unit at CLS. She advocates for low-income Philadelphians to have access to affordable water, heat, and electricity in their homes through direct legal representation and policy advocacy. Welcome, Kitesha. And thank you to all of our panelists for taking the time to be with us today. Great. Um, hi, everyone. My name's Emily, and I'm so glad that Annie, Susan, Tiffany, and Kitesha are here. Some members of the audience have already submitted questions, and we plan to have time at the end to answer as many as we can. But if you do have questions during the panel, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box, and they will either be answered in the chat or brought up at the end. So first, we're going to hear from our panelists about existing protections and services for domestic violence survivors in Philadelphia. Just a quick reminder for the panelists, we have a live interpreter interpreters today. Um, so please remember to pause when you talk and to speak in shorter sentences that, than you usually would so the interpreter has time to say everything that you have said. So with that, we can get started. I will pass the mic to Annie from Women Against Abuse who will be discussing how domestic violence can impact different parts of a survivor's life and how advocates can help. Hi everyone, it's um, so nice to be with you virtually. Um, again, my name is Annie Bowl. I'm at the Intake and Service Coordinator at Women Against Abuse in the Legal Center. Um, first, I'll just give you a brief overview of some serv of services at Women Against Abuse. Um, if we could just advance to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so, Women Against Abuse, um, our services um, involve the participation in the Philadelphia Domestic Violence Hotline, which is operated 24 seven in partnership with Congresso, Lutheran Settlement House and Women in Transition. We also have two 24 hour emergency safe havens, which provide um, free services to survivors um, of all gender identities and their children. Sojourner House is our transitional housing program. 
um, which consists of family apartments for survivors where they can live for up to 18 months. Um, we also have a policy and prevention arm, which offers a variety of workshops um, throughout the community and then the legal center. So the legal center services, um, we are available Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. The best way to access our services is by contacting our main number, which is right here on the slide, um, and that I can say in my sleep and maybe in my dreams, 215-686-7082. Um, um, we provide free legal advocacy and representation for survivors of all um, gender identities who are experiencing relationship violence um, related legal matters. Um, and this is just an, an overview of some of the services that survivors um, may receive or services um, might include the following. So representation, for protection orders and custody and support matters. Our fast track team is in family court each day, um, guiding clients through the filing process and procedures, um, assisting with issues involving service, um, providing advice on legal options, negotiating agreements, and representing at trial in some cases. Um, we also have a criminal court advocacy, probation advocacy, and police advocacy and training um, programs, and then legal options counseling and safety planning. It really is at the heart of what all members of the legal center are doing every day. And we are engaging with our clients, providing legal options counseling and safety planning in some form um, in almost every encounter um, with survivors. So in terms of protection from abuse orders, um, some things to consider. Number one, never tell anyone that they should file for a PFA. So, we can't emphasize um, that enough. And why is that the case? Because clients know their situation best um, and what is going to keep them and their family safe. And a PFA is not always the, um, the best avenue for them to pursue or the one that they um, are most interested in pursuing at that moment in time. I think that one of the things that we strive to do most in the legal center is always leaving the door open for survivors um, so that maybe an option that they are considering or contemplating at one point, they may not be interested in engaging at the legal system at that moment, but that will certainly always encourage people to call us um, whenever they need further assistance. So again, things to consider, safety concerns, like will filing a PFA um, risk an escalation in the behaviors um, and make the situation actually less safe for them, um, enforcing the order and the challenges in doing so, service, which um, if someone lacks a good address for the person that, um, has been abusive, it can be um, it can be a limitation. So that's just something to consider. Limits of the remedies that are available through PFAs, which I believe Sue may get into in a little more depth in her presentation, just in terms of PFAs. Um, no guarantee um, that the um, outcome will be that the survivor is granted either a temporary or final order. Um, frustrations in general about the court process and um, a survivor's maybe prior experience with the court process, and also just some misconceptions about custody, that sometimes a client's goals in terms of custody don't necessarily align with um, the outcomes that could be expected in family court. And just to emphasize one more time, never um, telling the survivor um, or you know anyone that they should file for a protection order.
So in terms of um, the legal definition of domestic violence, um, this is the scope um, that is encompassed in the, in the Pennsylvania statute. So physical violence, sexual assault, threats of violence, false imprisonment, physical or sexual abuse of children and stalking or harassment. So again, this is the legal, this is domestic violence as legally defined in the statute. So at Women Against Abuse though, um, and of course other agencies who are working with survivors, we take a much more comprehensive and inclusive view of how intimate partner is um, impacting a survivor's life. Um, so if we could just advance to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so abuse comes in many forms and is often difficult to detect. So physical abuse, um, you know, some of the spheres that I just enumerated um, in our previous slide. Um, but then also, of course, there's um, verbal abuse. So a survivor could be threatened by um, the person who's abusive, yelling, screaming at them, making demeaning comments. Um, and it can also, verbal abuse can um, lead to and is often used along with emotional abuse. And emotional abuse, it includes put downs, name calling, um, humiliating the survivor in front of others, maybe making them feel guilty or blaming them for the abuse um, and behaviors and comments that further erode their self-esteem. And then finally, financial abuse. So it actually occurs in approximately 99% of abusive relationships. So this is something that almost every survivor who we're working with is experienced in some manner. So many survivors describe it as the main reason that they stayed in an abusive relationship um, or went back to one. So the financial abuse creates an intentional dependence um, and further entraps someone in the relationship. Um, and this is you know, for someone who's already maybe quite isolated, the financial abuse certainly causes um, a, fur a further isolation or kind of cements that isolation. So how do we enhance safety and support stability for our survivors? So at the legal center um, intake, which is what we refer to as our detailed interview that we have um, with our clients provides us one opportunity to engage in really holistic safety planning and help a survivor identify forms of abuse that they've experienced, um, how their life has been impacted. Um, you know, and of course, we're, our focus is the legal matter that they are experiencing at that at that point in time, but um, we really do try to take a holistic view and see how we can um, also introduce things like the housing and employment ordinances, which we'll be hearing in more depth about shortly, um, the public benefit waiver, utility protections, which all serve to expand a survivor's options um, and also helps to support their goals. Um, and finally, like these measures can also provide just some welcome relief for a survivor who is in the process of exploring resources um, and getting connected with further services, which we know takes time and the court processes take time. So these other protections can really help buy time for the client and all, like while they're, um, continuing to work towards their goals, which may also evolve. So, you know, we're here to just um, continue to support them through that process. So thank you, everyone. I, I'll turn it back over to Emily. 
Thank you, Annie. I appreciate it so much. And thank you for all of the work that you do at Women Against Abuse. Um, so now we're going to turn to Susan, a senior attorney at Philadelphia Legal Aid, to discuss additional legal protections such as abuse from or protection from abuse orders and what they can offer. So I will pass the mic to you, Susan. Hi, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Um, just echoing real quick what Annie said, we work really closely with Women Against Abuse and are constantly referring um, clients back and forth to one another as um, with the people you're going to hear from at CLS. And we also at PLA try and do a lot of safety planning, um, a lot of thinking about what is the best or explaining to a survivor um, so they can make a good decision about what it, the best course of action is for them in that moment. And as Annie said, it often changes, um, but it's it's ha rarely or never happens that um, a survivor only needs one thing, right? So they don't just need protection order or they don't just need custody. They often need um, help with housing or figure, or public benefits or you know, all kinds of things, because when you're leaving a relationship, um, you're, every aspect of your life can be impacted. And so I'm just talking, we can go to the next slide. I'm gonna just talk a little bit about um, what's covered by protection, Pennsylvania's Protection from Abuse Act and the legal part of it. Um, so we already talked about this a little bit, but what I'm gonna just say what is not covered or you know, lots of different types of abuse that we see all the time. Um, threats of taking children or custody of children. Um, we did mention the economic abuse and I'd like for us to remember how difficult it is for any survivor, but when you are um, a non-English speaker and not familiar with the court system or you are a new immigrant, or even an older immigrant, um, accessing the courts um, and law enforcement can be really scary. Um, so, and the threats of deportation and use of immigrant status against a uh, survivor of um, family violence is something we see a lot and other forms of coercive control. Next slide. So, um, the process of getting a protection from abuse act, it's not easy. Um, it takes all day sometimes. If you have an attorney, uh, the attorney can file for you. Um, if you don't have an attorney, most and most people will start, this is the first thing that they're doing when they are separating from an abuser is getting a protection order. It's often people's first contact with any type of legal aid or with the courts. Um, and so it provides for emergency, temporary, and final protection orders, and we'll talk about that in a second. So um, who does the, who can get a protection from abuse order, um, or who can even file? So family or household members, and that is people who are married, separated, or divorced, parents and children, siblings, um, other blood and um, relatives through marriage and adoption, sexual or intimate partners, current or formal, and this includes dating uh, relationships, of course, same-sex relationships, past relationships, um, and you don't need to have actually have had sex if you are just in a romantic relationship, that is enough. Um, and a parent or other adult can file on behalf of a minor child. Next one. So where do you go? For during business hours, um, during when court is open, family court at 1501 Arch, the eighth floor has a domestic violence intake unit. Um, there is often an advocate from Women Against Abuse in the unit that people can speak with if they have questions or just to help them understand the process. Um, the unit is supposed to be open till like two, three, four o'clock. But often by like 10, 1030, depends on the day, they can't take any more people. So it's good to go early in the morning. Um, and you, there is ability to file when the court is closed at the Criminal Justice Center at 13th and Filbert in the basement. Um, you can get what's called an emergency ex parte order. The other orders are just temporary ex parte orders. This is the emergency process. And it requires that um, 
some incident occurred within basically within the past 24 hours. If there's some reason why the per plaintiff, the person who's filing can't wait until the next business day. Um, and so on weekends and holidays, you can go there. It provides for some, but not all of the relief that you can get in a temporary protection order. So it can do these things. Um, so a temporary protection order, as soon as someone files, um, their petition is reviewed by a judge. Um, the judge might, add, they also have to appear before a judge and the judge might ask them a few questions. Um, same sort of thing happens at the emergency filing unit. If, you, if someone files at the emergency filing unit, that order is sent over to the family court by the next business day. And that judge in the domestic relations court will look it over and can change it, add it, or keep it the same. Um, add different protections or subtract protections. Um, so it can be for, the temporary order can be for protection only, which means the two parties, plaintiff and the defendant, the plaintiff is a person who filed, the defendant is who it's against. They can have contact with one another, um, but the defendant can abuse, harass, stalk, threaten the plaintiff. It can require eviction of the defendant from the home, a relinquishment of firearms and weapons, and it can address um, child custody or supervised visits of children. So um, in order to have the protection order include um, well, I'll talk about that in a second. So um, when you, the hearing is scheduled within 10 days, and um, this is really like a basic outline. There's a lot more that goes into it. The defendant has to be served and that's a difficult process. Sometimes it has to be personal service. The sheriffs will uh, serve petitions that are filed at the court um, during regular business hours. And there's a process for that. If not, plaintiffs can go to the police and the police will assist with service. Um, so orders can be entered by agreement of the parties. They can be entered by default if the plaintiff can show that good service was made on the defendant and the defendant doesn't appear, it can be entered by default. Or it can be done by a hearing after the judge hears from both parties. Um, if the plaintiff doesn't appear, then the petition is dismissed and any temporary order that was in effect will be vacated. It will no longer be in effect. So what is the relief that someone can get from a final order? Uh, the order can include some or all of these things and or it could be protection only um, so they can have contact. But a full order usually means there cannot be any contact unless specifically provided for. So it can include no abuse, no contact, eviction of the defendant from the plaintiff's residence, temporary child support, which can include paying rent or mortgage of the party's home. It can include temporary custody of the children and should include safety provisions for exchanges or if there's any risk of harm to the plaintiff or the children. Um, our supervised visitation facility in Philadelphia used to be at the court. There isn't one now. There's advocates in the city that are working towards um, hopefully having one in Philadelphia, but right now it's hard to have supervised visits. There's not a lot of options for people. Um, it, the order can also include relinquishment of weapons and the sheriffs are to assist in um, obtaining those weapons from the defendant. And it can include reimbursement of reasonable losses suffered by the plaintiff. So if the defendant threw a brick through the window, um, the plaintiff can ask for the cost of the window or her tire or their tires were slashed. The, the plaintiff can ask the defendant to have to pay for that. It can also include days missed from work and things like that. It's not so easy to get and you would need to ask for these things in the petition. So when you file a petition, there's different boxes you have to check. You would have had to have checked those boxes when the plaintiff is filing. Um, so you can evict under only certain circumstances and it's kind of sounds confusing, but it's 
really just when the defendant has a marital or obligation to support um, the plaintiff or the children. So if they're married or they have kids together, then it's possible that the defendant can be evicted from the home. So if the, and if the residence is owned or leased solely by the plaintiff, the plaintiff, the defendant can be evicted from that home. If it's owned or leased by both parties, the defendant can also be evicted. Even if the um, property is owned or leased solely by the defendant, if the defendant owes a duty of support to the plaintiff, um, meaning they are married or have children together and the defendant owes a duty of support to the children, then that person can be evicted from the home. And that's a really important provision in the protection from abuse statute as you know, housing is one of the things that often might prevent a survivor from leaving. So enforcement and um, extension of orders. So orders can be um, entered for a maximum of three years. Um, they can be extended if there has been a finding of contempt or if the plaintiff files to extend and can show the defendant has done certain things acted in a way that has, gives her reasonably, reasonable belief that the defendant will continue to abuse, help, harass, stalk, or threaten her, um, the order can be extended. And you go, and go through the same process by filing the petition and having a hearing. Contempt is not so easy, um, but there are civil and criminal remedies for contempt of protection orders. And the best advice to give a survivor is if she feels safe in doing so is to contact the police and make a police report every time there's a violation. Um, there are domestic violence advocates in each um, district that can assist uh, survivors with making these reports or trying to get somebody charged. And if you don't want to go the criminal route or the um, detectives or the DAs decide not to go forward with a criminal case, there's also civil contempt, which a petition can be filed by the plaintiff um, saying that the defendant has uh, not filed the order, violated the order by contacting them or showing up at their place of work or whatever it might be, calling them, or, um, and a hearing so will be held. A one minute warning, just so you know. Okay, thanks. Um, and so there are um, penalties for that, for violation. Um, an act of abuse can separate from, there's a separate charge of violation of contempt of a protection order in addition to whatever the act itself was. And I'll try and just get it. You can skip this one because it has other people. So um, PLA's intake. So in order to receive services from Philadelphia Legal Assistance, we have income guidelines. You have to be the survivor, the person seeking services has to be below a certain income. It's 125% of the poverty level. There are exceptions. We can go up to 200%. Um, the way to reach us is 9.30 to 12, call our intake hotline. The number is there or people can apply online. Um, the important thing to note is there are way more people that need representation than we can provide with all of these resources and Women Against Abuse attorneys and PLA attorneys. We can only represent a fraction of the people who need assistance in family court. There's no right to an attorney. So um, many, a lot of what we do and what WA will do is try and help people be prepared to represent themselves since we can't represent everyone, but please contact us um, if you have clients that need our help. Thank you so much, Susan. Very much appreciate your insight and all of the amazing information that you shared. Um, so now we're going to switch over to the folks at Community Legal Services. So I will pass it to Tiffany and Kentesia to discuss what options survivors have in regards to housing, utilities, public benefits, and unpaid leave. I will pass the mic over. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for the for for inviting me and for having me here uh, today. Um, as stated earlier, my name is Tiffany Holland-McEnany. I am a supervising attorney in the housing unit. Um, I'm 
primarily in municipal court on Monday and Friday mornings, handling a gazillion um, eviction matters, in, <laughs> um, and then typically it, taking care of the cleanup thereafter. Um, but like a good uh, law student, I focused on the question presented, um, which is what do survivors need to know about the Philadelphia um, Unfair Rental Practices Ordinance? And I'm ready to just kind of launch into that. Okay, so this is a lot right here. <laughs> Um, but I kind of wanted to just put the law there. Um, so two laws that are of significance to us is the Philadelphia Fair Housing Ordinance, Section 9804, Unfair Rental Practices. In addition to that, there's VIWA for a public housing, which I'll get to later. Um, it's straightforward. Uh, an owner operating or managing the premises shall, at the request of a tenant, who is a victim of domestic violence or sexual assault, permit the tenant to terminate the lease, regardless of the lease term and without penalty for early termination, provided the request is made in writing within 90 days of the reporting of an incident of domestic violence or sexual assault, the issuance of a pr protection from abuse order or the approval of a rental of a consent agreement. And this has to happen at least 30 days before the request determination date. So that's the notice that you would need to provide. In addition, the victim needs to vacate the premises no later than the, um, excuse me, the survivor needs to vacate the premises no later than the early termination date. And at the time the request is made uh, for the termination of the lease, the tenant should, uh, the tenant provides a court order or uh, approved consent agreement for protection of abuse and incident report from the police department stating that a domestic abuse or sexual assault complaint was filed by the tenant or written certification from a healthcare professional professional guidance counselor um, licensed under the laws of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. In addition, a victim services organization, even CLS uh, constitutes that as well, stating that the tenant sought assistance uh, as a victim of domestic violence or sexual assault. It's a mouthful, but like it, it lays it out, everything that you need to know when you're dealing with these kinds of situations, so. Um, if the abuser slash perpetrator of the domestic violence slash sexual assault is a co-tenant, the owner managing the premises may, upon the victim's request, it's an ask, bifurcate the lease in order to evict the abuser or perpetrator of the domestic violence or sexual assault while allowing the survivor to remain on the premises. Um, it is unlawful for any owner, landlord, agent, uh, operating or managing premises to terminate a lease with, uh, with a tenant or make, alter, amend, modify any term or condition of any existing lease or arrangement of tenancy with the tenant in retaliation of an incident of domestic violence or sexual assault in which a tenant was the victim or a tenant status as a victim of domestic violence or a tenant has the status of um, status as a victim of domestic violence or sexual assault. For some reason, the, when I did the press, when I did the, um, the, they just wouldn't pop up. I don't know what's going on. All right. Um, okay, so fair housing. It applies to all tenants in Philadelphia who are survivors of domestic violence or sexual assault. It establishes the, that survivors have a right to break their lease. It establishes that a tenant cannot be evicted because they are survivors of domestic violence or sexual assault. Incidents involving domestic violence can be used as a defense. My cat is attacking me right now, forgive me, okay. <laughs> um, it's a defense to eviction, right? So you, you're going to raise that as a defense. You hope that the judge that you are standing in front of has um, the ability to, um, or has the knowledge and the, the uh, experience and the information to understand what they have in front of them um, so that the defense can actually be raised and it be successful. Um, Survivors can be evicted for non-payment of rent. Uh, so there are some situations in which, um, where we mentioned a, a, a survivor can't be evicted due to um, being a survivor of domestic violence. What does that look like? So for example, if your landlord wants to evict, uh, if a landlord wanted to evict a survivor due to the police being called, um, they can't. If the police were called uh, due to a DV issue, um, this is typically a successful defense when you're dealing with a landlord that's threatening to evict a survivor. Um, the caveat with that is if you lose income as a result of 
domestic violence or sexual assault, you still can be evicted for non-payment of rent. We've all seen cases like that where the survivor, the money may be taken from the survivor, right? And so they don't have the ability to actually pay their rent. The DV is the reason why they can't pay rent. It's the reason why they're being evicted. Yet and still, if it's just if the, if the basis is from non-payment only, there's not much we can do there. Um, okay, where am I at? Uh, okay, it's, um, fair housing order. It's also established that a survivor can request the bifurcation of the lease agreement, and if the landlord is agreeable, the landlord owner has the landlord owner has to agree to this. The survivor will then be responsible for full contract rent. Thinking about this in like um, our day-to-day -day work, that in of itself is problematic, right? Because oftentimes the survivors cannot pay for a contract rent. They can't afford it. So although we have this um, carve out for them, it still does present um, difficulties uh, in, in terms of being able to stay in a property that they may not have been paying rent for by themselves. The option's there, but it, it doesn't necessarily negate the difficulty. I think there's another one. You can go to the next slide. Let me make sure. Okay, VAWA, Violence Against Women's Act. Okay. It applies to survivors living in public housing, Section 8 housing, and certain other federally funded subsidies. Subsidies. It's a lot. It's a lot, you guys. Like it, it's a, it's it's a long list. Oftentimes we 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 never really have a good handle on all of the federally funded uh, subsidies. You kind of just it's case by case. But whenever we find a new one, we're always excited to be able to add it to the list <laughs> so that we're we're ahead of the game the next time. Um, it applies to people of all gender identities and survivors of dating violence and stalking. Um, a tenant cannot be denied admission to a subsidy program because they are a domestic violence um, survivor. Um, so in terms of admissions, right, uh, what does that look like? How can a survivor be penalized um, for the DV? Um, having a criminal record due to domestic violence um, where, where the survivor was the victim. That could be a problem um, with admission into, in, into public housing or getting a Section 8 voucher or things of that nature. Um, and so we see those kinds of cases pretty consistently, right? Um, in addition to that, transfers. Um, in public housing uh, and certain other subsidized properties, you can request a transfer to a new unit. Um, if the, if, if the survivor feels that they are unsafe or it's as a result of current or former DV, um, if there's a section eight, uh, sec a section eight housing choice voucher and uh, they would like to transfer, they are able to do that as well. If the need is, is necessitated um, due to escaping domestic violence uh, or the threat of this. Keeping in mind, these are while these are protected, you're still asking an entity to let you do something, right? And it can be subjective at times. So, you know, when we have clients that are doing self certs and they're explaining their DV situation, this is in the context of maybe um, public housing, we're very careful to make sure that they're documenting what's going on. They've worded it in a way that clearly expresses um, their circumstances so that when we when we send this out, the person on the receiving end um, gets a clear picture as to why this move needs to happen and why it needs to happen now. And then um, in addition to that eviction defense, right? So oh, did I get ahead of myself? Eviction defense. If you are a survivor of the world, um, if your landlord wants to evict you because there's damage to the property. There's been a fight in the property. There are damages um, caused by the perpetrator uh, from a do domestic violence dispute. You uh, tenant survivors can raise the VAWA, um, can raise VAWA as a defense. Um, and for all of those mentioned, whether it be admissions, transfers, eviction defenses under the under the um, VAWA umbrella, um, you can provide evidence such as the PFA or a police report. Um, or like I mentioned earlier, they can fill out a self certificate of domestic violence. Best practices, all right. Um, 
so we talk a lot about this at, at CLS and the housing unit because the work can become a lot. Um, and and we want to we want to make sure we're putting our best foot forward. And so we try to convene as often as possible to figure out how we can do it, how we can do this work the best that we can. And so what does that look like, especially when you have the intersection between domestic violence and housing, we make it a point to plan and implement safe communication strategies. Um, so, for example, we're using safe words. Um, we are calling it safe times. We're choosing the mode of communication most suitable for our clients. Um, and using yes and no questions when, when, um, when feasible. Ab you know, obviously this is on intake, right? So when we're trying to to reach out to to clients and we're trying to assist them with whatever issue they may be having specifically around DV, we're very careful about that. Um, in addition to that, it you know, developing tools for emotional support, right? So praising. Um, the 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 survivor when they've accomplished something it may be minuscule but it's it's something and so we do a, we make a point to really um praise them for the work that they've done and validate um the things that they've done thus far um we make a point to avoid naming violence before the client has named it everybody you know i in life experiences you don't know the person sitting across from you you don't know um what has cause them to be created in the way that they are and, and what and, and, and how they operate and how they approach life. And so because of that, um, we're very careful to allow the um, the survivor, the tenant, the client to kind of set, set the tone. Um, and then build on the survivor's sense of safety and definition and, and, and definition of success to establish manageable goals. So that's letting the, uh, the our clients, the our, our survivor to, to drive this train, right? We don't, we just kind of take a step back. We're here to provide support, to give best advice, um, be amazing advocates when we can, but they drive the train. Um, and then the last two manage client expectations, obviously, you know, like I said, much of this is an ask of someone else. And so there may often be battles in order to get things done. CLS is up for the, for the battle, the housing unit is up for the battle, but it, we have to manage our clients' expectations. And then lastly, practicing self-care. And this is for the advocate, the attorneys, whoever is involved with the clients. You know, in order to give your best self, we make a point to say, take a step back. When you've been dealing with a, a, a situation or a client that's been super um, stressful, just kind of decompressing before you go to anything else so that, you know, you can live right another day and help someone else. Um, let's see, is that it? I don't know if I have anything else. So the yeah, thank you. Um, here's my contact information. Um, I can be reached at tmacinani at clsvilla.org. Also, my office number is 267-443-2671. Um, obviously, if there is an issue, feel free to contact the Lieutenant Hotline at 267-443-2500. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Tiffany. Appreciate it. We will pass it to Kentisha. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Contagia Scott. I'm an attorney in the energy unit at CLS. Um, so I'm going to do a two part presentation. I'm going to share some information on behalf of my colleagues in the health and independence unit regarding TANF, um, one of the public benefits. And then I'll also um, talk about some utility protections that are available for survivors as well. Next slide. So um, the only cash assistance that is available through the county assistance office, it's called TANF, which is the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. I'm sure many of you have heard of it, but it's good to know, you know exactly what it is. So the only people who are eligible for this cash assistance are families with related minor children living with them and pregnant women. Um, this program has many rules for their participants, including requirements for filing for child support or work hour requirements. And these rules can be barriers to applicants, especially those who are survivors of domestic violence. Next slide. However, um, the county assistance office can excuse um, 
survivors of domestic violence from these rules. Again, these work requirement rules, the, the, the requirement to file for child support, other time limits. They simply have to use the domestic violence verification form. Next slide. Apologies for this small form, um, but you should just know um, this, is, this is the verification form. Any third party person can complete the form in section three on behalf of the client, but a client can also complete the form themselves via self affirmation. So there's no requirement here to have some form of court order or a protection from abuse order. They simply have to fill out this verification form, which, you know, they could have an attorney or an advocate who's familiar with their case or um, they can self-affirm this form. Next slide. Um, and again, um, filling out that form basically has the impact of waiving the rules that might be barriers to accessing this public, this cash assistance um, for survivors of domestic violence. Also good to note that um, in regards to the violence, there is no requirement of a relationship with the abuser or perpetrator. It can be a stranger, a neighbor, employer, colleague, friend, everyone is included and it also, everyone can be included and it can also include sexual assault. This includes also violence of any type or the threat of violence. So it's a very broad um, definition that can be encompassed. Um, and again, a person can self-affirm or have someone familiar with the situation also attest to this on that um, verification form. Next slide. Okay. Um, so what about other public benefits? So these rules that kind of, um, that provide these pro protections are specifically related to this cash assistance program, TANF temporary assistance for needy families, but you may also be able to work with the county assistance office to be excused from other, um, to, to be excused from rules for other programs such as Medicaid or SNAP. It's really decided on a case by case basis. Um, this form can also be used, the, the, the domestic violence verification form can also be used um, to excuse applicants for subsidized childcare programs from certain rules. Um, now, again, here, um, unlike for TANF, this waiver is based, um, the waiver is time limited for this subsidized child care program. Again, here, if you have any concerns, um, I'm happy to connect you with our colleagues over in the health and independence unit who can help you work through these issues. Um, next slide. I know we're short on time. Um, so again, here, if you have any issues um, accessing public benefits or have um, some concerns about um, one of your clients or um, are, your, are the survivor yourself accessing these various domestic violence protections from the County Assistance Office, office you can call CLS. Um, here's our intake hotline number, 215-981-3700. Um, and here are the health and independence units um, in person and phone intake hours. Please be aware that the 1410 West Erie office is our North Philadelphia office located at Broad and Erie. That is where in, in person intake occurs for our health and independence unit, but phone intake is always available um, as well. And here is their direct phone intake number, but you can also call general intake as well. Next slide. So I'm going to. Motor a little bit, utility protections. Sorry to speed through this, but we're coming close to the end here. Um, again, I'm gonna build off of what Tiffany said, you know, uh, these protections are very important in the housing context, but you know, you also need utilities. So um, next slide. So I'm gonna talk about regulated utility customers, which are the PICO and PGW customers, and then the water customers. The water company is a municipal company. They have a different step, set of statutory protections. So to qualify for protections under the public utility code um, for PICO and PGW, unfortunately, a survivor is going to have to provide the utility with a copy 
of a protection from abuse order or other or court order evidencing domestic violence. They're going to have to provide these um, court orders to the utility itself. Next slide. But there are some protections. Once those, um, once that documentation is provided to the utility, just know that a survivor of DV can only be held responsible for bills that were in their name. They cannot be terminated for non-payment of a bill for um, service that is in someone else's name. So they might have been in the same property as their, their abuser or the perpetrator. They cannot be held responsible for the bill that was accrued under their name, under that perpetrator's name, even if they lived in the residence. Um, and they cannot be required if they move out of the residence and are able to establish their own residence, that bill cannot follow them to the, the new residence. Additionally, when it comes to termination, um, the utility must attempt direct personal contact before terminating the per person's service. And if they don't reach them, they have to post the notice and get an additional 48 hours of protection. Also note that there are flexible payment arrangements that are available for um, for survivors of domestic violence from utilities. Next slide. Um, hopefully you go back and look at this um, in the recording if you need to reference it, but just know that the Public Utility Commission can arrange a longer payment arrangement um, and it can be more than five years. And it's just gonna be taking into account the survivor's personal circumstances. Next slide. Okay, and you should also know if an issue comes up um, and you're unable to address it with the utility, you can always call the Public Utility Commission and file a complaint, they'll do an investigation. And this also has the effect of stopping a termination um, before it occurs, as long as you file that complaint before, um, the, at least a day before the termination is scheduled to occur. I'm running up on time, but I just wanna mention the water department really quickly. Um, just know, as I mentioned, um, the water department is regulated, basically it's by the city. Um, so the, the protections for the water department are a little different. Um, survivors of domestic violence would be able to qualify under um, the customer assistance program for the water department um, under the special, um, the special hardship clause. So this would take into account domestic violence as well as other things such as job loss, illness, um, and they would qualify for a, a more affordable water bill and the um, income tiers are here, but know that it would be 4% of income if they don't qualify for a lower um, income tier, it would be 4% of their income for their monthly water bill, as long as they um, fill out the application and provide those um, provide some supporting information or documentation about their experience as a survivor, which we're happy to talk with you from the energy unit about what that would look like. Next slide. And then again, this just, just talks about that again, they do have to provide a protection from abuse order, but also noting that they, um, the water department will also accept a letter from the county assistance office, um, which granted the waiver for TANF. So if someone is accessing public benefits and they get a letter from um, the county assistance office, they can also use that letter for the water department to apply for an affordability program. Uh, okay, I'm at time. Um, here's some information. We, uh, the energy unit uses general intake. So you can call 215-981-3700 um, for, for assistance. Thank you so much. Very much appreciate that. I know that there's a lot of information that we want to share with folks, um, and we, we will be sending out a email with the recording and additional materials and resources. Um, just a quick question from the Q&A that I wanted to bring up um, from Anonymous was, how would a, an agent at CLS answer if someone decides to call, assuming that person is a first-time caller? How would the caller address the problem and not get hung up? I'm not sure if that, yeah. I'm not sure what the, um, I mean, I, I, the people from, the folks from CLS can surely answer this, but mm -hmm. I know that um, 
we try and assist everyone. And sometimes intake lines are busy or there's a problem, but usually if you call back or do the online intake, someone will get back to you. I would second that. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Yeah. We're there. We want to help. <laughs> we want right. to help. Yeah. Just please just leave a message with the best contact information. And if there are some specific circumstances, like you would prefer a text, you prefer an email, please just leave that information with the intake person or on the message. Also in your handouts, your, um, when you get the materials, there's going to be a big um, chart that says, do you need um, do you need help with a legal problem? And that's from PLA and CLS because we have op overlapping services. And it tells you of like each type of problem, um, when and how you should contact the office. That's super helpful. Yeah, I mean, we definitely will send all of that um, information out afterwards. Um, thank you guys for answering that question. I know everyone is very busy. Um, and so I think the suggestion of going online and calling again is um, really useful. So it is 12.59, we are almost right on the dot. Um, so we are going to wrap up, but we want to thank our incredible panelists for being here and to all of the audience members for your engagement on this very important subject. Um, Liz from our office will be sharing her screen with some additional resources on it. And then within a few days, again, you can expect an email with a recording of the panel and then additional materials and resources. So thank you so much to our panelists um, for sharing your knowledge and your time today. And then thank you for everyone who attended the DV protections panel today. Hope you guys have a great afternoon.